21st of January 2024, John Hammond coming to you from Norwich, UK. I'm now in the city centre, about to go into a church building for the traditional uh, but informal church service. And on the way here, um, I bumped into a couple of brothers going to another church building but I know these to be true brothers in the true Holy Spirit. Now that may sound like I'm being judgmental and almost like picking and choosing who is in the Holy Spirit, who isn't in the Holy Spirit. But of course, in these days of delusion and confusion, we need the Holy Spirit within us, literally within us, within our spirit, within our soul, within our body. We need the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts with which to distinguish others who are brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, brethren in Christ, the body of Christ. And we've been given the Holy Spirit partly, partly, partly for this reason, so that he, the Holy Spirit, is within us, bearing witness of who also has the Holy Spirit. And if they haven't received the Holy Spirit, but they are true believers, churchgoers, followers, believers, even ministers, but they have yet to have received the Holy Spirit, have yet to have been born of God, born again, to receive forgiveness of sins, they might be believers, they might even be ministers, they might be theologians, but soulish beliefs of the mind and the emotions that's not enough it's not enough to believe there was a historical figure called Jesus Christ because that's to put Jesus on the same level as Buddha there was a, a historical teacher called Buddha and of course people follow Buddha uh, people follow prophets people follow Joseph Smith supposedly supposedly a prophet supposedly a man of god who started his own church the mormon church <clears throat> 200 years ago when he had that vis vision from an angel called moroni and that name doesn't exist anywhere except in joseph smith's mind when he started that religion based around a version of jesus christ so false Christ, false prophets, false teachers, false Christs, false messiahs. In Jesus' literal day, there were already people coming claiming to be the Messiah. And, and, and they saw Jesus as yet another one. Only this one's from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? But they, they didn't look deeper into Jesus' life, his birth, because he was born in Bethlehem. John the Baptist, we touched on this the other day. These are not the days of Elijah. These are not the days of John the Baptist. These are the days that Jesus prophesied about through Joel and in Acts 1 and 2. Likewise, in the last days, God says that he will pour out his spirit on all people, all, of, all people, all people, all 100 percent of all people. But which spirit are they listening to? And I'm going to put it in quotes. Which quotes Holy Spirit are they listening to? Because those claiming to know the Holy Spirit, like the Jehovah Witnesses do, and have for nearly 30 years now, they call themselves Christian, they call themselves born again, followers of Christ. <clears throat> and when we start talking about the Holy Spirit to them, they say that they do have the Holy Spirit, but they call the Holy Spirit it, an impersonal force. And of course, the Holy Spirit within us, we know he is God. God, the Holy Spirit, God, the only begotten Son, God, the Father. Yahweh, the Spirit of the living God, lives in us, his living saints. Those who are of us who are alive in Christ, alive to Christ, 
alive to the Holy Spirit, which means we are alive to all the spiritual gifts, including prophecy. So we're going to close this. I'm, I'm not going to make it too long because I'm going to be, quote, late for the start of the service. And people don't like that usually. So I'm trying to be on time, not to upset people. So this is going to be a brief introduction to the fact that we're born again in Christ and Christ is in us by his spirit to receive the Holy Spirit within the temple, the human spirit that God made before we were created in the womb. God knew us, he made us, he sent us into this world for such a time as this. Now, whether your name is Esther or not, that applies to you. Once you're born of God, Christ's Spirit's in you, and you can talk to literal kings and priests you can talk to Jesus, of course, the King above all kings. And when you're born of God, you, you, you come to understand <clears throat> you're a child who needs milk. You start growing up. You start hearing things from mature believers around you who are true disciples of Christ and they have the Holy Spirit and they're teaching you. But it's the Holy Spirit in them teaching you through them, through their heart, through their mind, through their vocal cords, the words come out to teach you the truth. And of course, as a young Christian, I was told, told, instructed, instructed, advised by people who are in the Holy Spirit to read the Bible myself, check out everything myself, test and weigh everything. I had a daily reading or two or even three daily readings every day with Jesus, daily bread. UCB word for today came out a bit later but I couldn't eat enough of the truth. And of course, we're coming to the point of understanding Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the living water. Where else can we go? Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. And the spirit of the living God is in us, his people, for us individually and through us to, to encourage each other in the Holy Spirit, to bring teaching to each other in the Holy Spirit, to prophesy one to another in the Holy Spirit. And so this preamble leads us to the point of uh, the other day I asked a cessationist, turned out they were a cessationist, quoting from John MacArthur throughout their Facebook page. And so I sent a private message to Messenger for them um, is John MacArthur still a cessationist? And this person, who obviously is a follower of John MacArthur and his words of wisdom, etc., in this private conversation on uh, Messenger, they were very curt, yes, and you, do you believe in cessationism? Yes. They made a statement about the, the Word of God, the canon of Scripture. And I said, yes, the Bible is perfect, infallible, and what about the Holy Spirit? What about prophecy? And this person didn't like it and basically blocked me from <clears throat> any further conversation with them. So I've kept it anonymous. I put it on Facebook because this is a sign of the times that even people calling themselves Christian, they've made up their mind. They're in a fixed position. And cessationism is a fixed position. And it's catch-22, unless they receive the Holy Spirit, prophecy, teaching, prophetic teaching, unless they receive the Holy Spirit in prophetic teaching about the Holy Spirit himself, then they're trapped in their ism, the religionism of cessationism. And, and, and birds of a feather flock together. So if you're a cessationist, you go to a cessationist church. And that's true for all the denominations. But Jesus has set us free from all the religious rules and regulations of modern day so-called Christianity. And over the last 30 years, it has become a business. Business methods, business terms, business structures, even sales and marketing, 
even merchandising, and it's all done in the name of Jesus to raise funds to do good works. And they've slightly got that the wrong way round. We are saved by Christ to do good works. But it's not the good works that count. It's obedience to God to do those good works. But in the name of Christ, in the, uh, uh, for the glory of God. And all these charities, even calling themselves Christian aid or whatever it is, Christians in action, whatever it is, unless they are giving God the glory, unless they are leading people to Christ, unless they are preaching the gospel in the context of what they're doing, unless it's centered on Christ, the cross of Christ, Christ crucified, the blood of the Lamb, what's the point? What's the point of it all? Because charitable works are not good enough for anyone to earn their way into heaven. If that was true, good charitable works, even done in the name of Jesus, or the, the name of some God who is likened to Christ, then the Freemasons will get in because they claim to be the second largest charity in the world, looking after widows and orphans, widowers, widows and orphans. They've got hospitals, care homes. They've got a big structure, a big system. And once you become a member of the Freemasons, it's like an insurance company. You pay your fees, you go through the rituals, birds of a feather, birds of a dark feather gather together in the darkness to do these rituals, believing they're good people, they're rich young rulers and rich old rulers in their various levels of their pyramid structure, their various degrees of hierarchy, the various degrees of masters. The master over the master over the master over the master over the master. It's a pyramid with Pharaoh at the top, Caesar at the top, and everybody else is less than the man at the top. And they do charity. And they, they have a, a sort of uh, a get-together, fellowship in quotes of human beings, all dressed the same in their suits and ties, drinking wine, eating food, drinking wine to each other, to the master of the lodge. And the master of the lodge is not Jesus Christ. They would tell you that if they're being honest. Jesus Christ is not featured in anything to do with Freemasonry. It's not part, he, his name is not part of the rituals. The cross is not mentioned. It's not centered on Christ. So, there are theologians who do believe in the Christ that we know personally, but they're not born again. John 3, verses 3 to 17 and 21, talks about the, the fact that Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a ruler, whether he was rich and young, I don't know, but he was certainly a Pharisee, came to Jesus at night for fear of the Jews, his colleagues, finding out that even to talk to Jesus was a taboo thing to do for the Pharisees, have nothing to do with that man, shun him, he's a false prophet. Well, that's what the Jehovah Witnesses do when, when one of their members finds Christ for themselves when the Holy Spirit comes on that particular member and uh, an elder I know from the JWs, he had that revelation. By reading the New King James Bible, he saw who Jesus was and is. And he told the elders in the meeting, we've got it wrong. I've found out who Jesus is. And of course, they said to him, well, you have to step down as being an elder because you don't believe what we believe. And he said, that's right, we've got it wrong about Jesus. And they looked at each other and said, well, we have to excommunicate you. You can't come here anymore because you don't believe what we believe. And they treated him as an enemy and they cast him out. And he'd been going there 50 years 
and they were all his technical friends and family. Spiritual, religious family, a religious society of Jehovah Witnesses, a society within society. But when the elder, Jehovah Witness elder, had the revelation of Jesus, he went there with the good news to tell them, we've got it wrong, we need to change our view and our doctrine about Jesus. And they threw him out. And that's what Jesus said would happen. If you talk to the Pharisees and you tell the Pharisees they're wrong, there's one thing that's going to happen. They're going to throw you out. They're going to ban you. They're going to excommunicate you. And if they're running a private company, they won't let you on their property and they'll take an injunction against you and they'll call the police and have you arrested for trespass in what is supposed to be God's house. My father's house of prayer. Not concerts, not theatres, not restaurants, not buying and selling, even in the outer courts. My Father's house of prayer is Christ's Father's house of prayer. Jesus' Father is my Father. I was the prodigal son. I rebelled. I left God and God's people. I went off to do my own thing. I became a Freemason. And Jesus spoke to me audibly as I was going through the third degree. A shout from heaven, you're in with the wrong lot. And I shuddered and I thought, yes, I am. And I, I was trapped in darkness. Couldn't get up, couldn't run out, couldn't tell anybody. I was trapped. But two months later, Mission England, Carra Road, the football ground, the gospel was going to be preached. And God somehow cancelled my board meeting and I was able to go. The Holy Spirit drew me there to hear the good news. God is your father, prodigal son, waiting for you to come back to him. And I thought in my mind, yes, I'm missing God in my life. And with that agreement with God, the Holy Spirit came in. He filled the black hole within my heart. Satan left. Jesus came in. And Jesus is in me. The spirit of the living God is in me and us. The born again, true believers filled with the Holy Spirit. And we suffer for the sake of Christ. And now we know that Jesus' prophecies are true. They will treat us badly. They will throw you out of the synagogues and the churches. They will not receive prophecy. <clears throat> they don't want to be told by a third party, especially by non-members especially by uh, people who are not on staff. People have no authority in that local church. People not licensed to preach. You can barely have a conversation with people before or after the, quotes proper service. Well, let's leave it there. We, we cannot convince people, not even with persuasive arguments, People who are blind and deaf, blind to Jesus, deaf to the Holy Spirit, they have to want to see. We ask you, Lord, to put your words in our mouth so that somehow a crack will appear in the hardness, like the walls of Jericho. That their walls, their resistance to the Holy Spirit will suddenly go and they'll be open to the Holy Spirit to receive the truth about you, Jesus, about your life, your birth, your life, your teaching, your death, your resurrection, and what you said. Wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to be given. He will come and baptize you with fire. Then go out and tell all the world <clears throat> what he has done, Jesus Christ. Christ crucified. He lived, he died, he was born fully human, he lived a fully human life, tempted in every way, he yet did not sin, and he died as the sinless, blameless Lamb of God on the cross, crucified, 
not an animal, <coughs> but the spirit of the living God suffered until Jesus himself understood. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he gave his life up to you, Father. <coughs> and you allowed your son to die. He paid the price for the sin. And then you raised him up. You resurrected him. And he's seated at your right hand. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Help us, Lord, to know today who to speak to, who not to speak to. And we ask you again, Lord, as we face a trial for our faith, even today, that you'll put your words in our mouth so they'll know it's not we who live, it's Christ who lives in us and speaks through us for their benefit and if they receive, they receive. If they reject, Father, we forgive them. We ask you, Lord, to water all the seeds that we have sown and we will sow. One day of salvation at a time. Bless all the brethren of the one God out there, my one siblings in Christ. And Lord, as we keep praying for each other, we press on. Putting our hand to the plow, like you said, Jesus, not looking back forgiving everybody for everything as we press on heavenwards. God bless you, brethren of the one God, his one church throughout this world. God bless.